a very good morning to everyone. Um, I'm, I'm really uh, pleased to welcome everyone to uh, the first uh, panel of today, uh, titled You Can't Always Get What You Want, uh, The Impact of Brexit on UK and Internal Security. Uh, my name is Ben Martill. I'm a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh, uh, dialing in from a surprisingly sunny Scotland, uh, and it's a real pleasure to have been invited to chair the proceedings here today. Uh, now we have an illustrious uh, panel of speakers whom I will introduce uh, properly when uh, just before their talk. Um, but for now, let me just uh, in introduce our panel. We have Lord Peter Ricketts, uh, Baroness Sally Hamwe, Professor Christian Cownert and Professor Elaine Fahey. And we'll have presentations uh, in that order. So I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll go through with the presentations to begin with. Uh, if I can ask uh, members of the panel to uh, and the audience to save their questions until the end, then we'll have plenty of time uh, for a QA. and um, I'm not sure exactly how long you want the talks to be. I'll, I'll probably start to cut people off after about uh, 12 or 13 minutes, um, but, but I'll try to be quite gentle with the chairing uh, and, and feel free to start before that if you like. Uh, and just a reminder that I'm sure you've all clicked the button, but we are being uh, recorded uh, here today. So without further ado, let's move to our first speaker of the session. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome uh, Lord Peter Ricketts. Um, as many of you know, Lord Ricketts was uh, Britain's first national security advisor uh, from 2010 and is now a crossbench member of the House of Lords, uh, where he currently sits on the Justice and Home Affairs Committee uh, and also a visiting professor at uh, King's College London. Uh, so Lord Ricketts, wonderful to have you here today and, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much indeed, Ben, and uh, good to see everyone, even if just virtually. Um, I should start by saying that um, I was previously the chair of the EU Security and Justice Committee in the Lords, um, and we produced a report last March on this subject, which I think is still quite topical. However, Baroness Sally Hamwe, who will speak next, is now the chair of the Lords uh, Justice and Home Affairs Committee, and I am a um, a humble member uh, sitting under Baroness Sally's chairmanship, which is where the action will be from now on in the Lords on these issues. And so I hope everyone will follow the proceedings in Baroness Hamry's committee, which will be important. Um, now, Ben, it's, it's uh, not an easy thing to follow um, a keynote of the quality that we've just had from Julian King, which I, I thought was to use an overused term magisterial in its balance and its uh, comprehensiveness. Um, and so I am really just putting a little bit of icing on, on Julian's cakes because he's covered very much of the ground very well. Uh, and I won't speak as long as 12 or 13 minutes. I think I'm keen to let there be some time for, for good discussion. I think some of the points of context that Julian made are just worth reinforcing. Someone asked in the, in the question session towards the end, why did we think the outcome on justice and home affairs was better than expected? Well, it was a lot better than it than was demonstrated could have been the outcome when you look at the foreign and security policy area, where the government refused any structured cooperation at all. Um, and it's interesting to reflect on why the difference of treatment between JHA, which now has a very detailed legal uh, set of arrangements, not perfect, but um, certainly much better than nothing, and um, external security and foreign policy, which has nothing at all. Both are areas where Britain has strong national interests in working with the EU. Um, both are areas where Britain is a major, has been a major provider of input to uh, EU policy making over the years. And yet, um, in the area of the legal order issue of, of JHA, there is a much better agreement. So, I mean, I think that that's really the distinction, and, and you know, I'm very glad to say that. Um, and it's an area where very complex problems like ECJ jurisdiction over uh, issues of surrender have been resolved, um, although they were not able to be resolved in the wider um, economic relationship. One other point of context is um, that, as Julian said, part three of the trade and cooperation agreement on this, this set of issues um, cannot be immune from the wider state of relations between the UK and the EU. And he mentioned the tensions over the Northern Ireland Protocol in particular. It just led me to think that perhaps it's a good idea that the TCA is structured in these three parts, which although not hermetically sealed from each other are quite separate. 
and part three has separate arrangements for suspension or termination, um, which might make, mean that it would be possible if there is a wider trade war involving suspension of other parts of the TCA, we could hope to preserve the uh, part three cooperation. However, that set of separate suspension and termination arrangements does introduce a degree of fragility into the whole thing. There are these specific uh, provisions about um, uh, what would happen in case of denunciation of the ECHR, surely not a very likely scenario, um, or deficiencies in the protection of fundamental human rights. Um, and there's also a considerable fragility in the area of data handling, and uh, Julian touched on this in terms of data adequacy. But of course, TC the TCA part three has a separate um, uh, set of arrangements uh, and separate standards for uh, data protection. There is a great deal of very sensitive personal data held under the part three TCA arrangements. And there is the specific provision that if either side showed a serious and systemic deficiency uh, in the handling of personal data, then uh, data adequacy could be withdrawn. And of course, the UK outside the EU is now a third country, including in terms of um, application of the treaties to national security matters. We are not subject to the national security carve out, which I think is in Article 4.2. Um, and as the Schrems judgments have shown, the European Parliament and the Court of Justice are not slow to scrutinize very carefully the handling of um, national security data by third countries using EU data are provided to them. So that's a, an area where we need to watch carefully. The Home Office's track record is not unblemished in the handling of uh, personal data. And if there were to be serious problems in that area, there could quite quickly be implications for the operation of the um, part three of the TCA. So those are, those are a couple of context issues. Each were mentioned by Julian as well. In the overall uh, assessment of, of the individual areas, the outcome there, I very much agree with Julian's analysis. Um, we did a report in, in the previous Lords Committee in March that we called Beyond Brexit, Policing Law Enforcement and Security. And having looked at it again in preparation for this, it's still, I think, pretty relevant. Um, as Julian King said, uh, in the area of access to databases like PRUM and ECRIS, the crime scene databases, the practitioners told us that our access is pretty much as good as it was before, although we will not, we will not be part of the shaping of the future of those instruments as circumstances change. Passenger name recognition, the same. Good access, important area, but uh, we will need to be very careful over the handling of the personal data we receive through the PNR system. The liaison arrangements in Europol and Eurojust again, uh, the UK get uh, very good um, third party associate access to, to those organizations where we were such a key provider. And hopefully that will allow operational cooperation to continue with the police forces. Um, Julian discussed briefly the issue of SIS2, the, the uh, crucial um, alert and information sharing database, which was so heavily relied on by UK policing. This was a real loss of operational capability. And I think our practitioner witnesses were all willing to accept that. The alternative is the Interpol I-24 system. We were told it is more clunky, uh, more resource intensive. Um, it was taking hours rather than seconds to load onto the police national computer. Um, there was talk of an automated system being introduced to speed that up, and I'm not clear whether that has yet happened. Um, and there is the issue of double keying, that EU law enforcement is required to enter the data a second time, first into SIS2 for themselves, their own use, and then secondly into I-24-7. Um, we we've been told since that the, uh, there doesn't seem to be any great fall off in the amount of uh, alerting material circulating, but of course we may not know how much we are not getting. Um, and then lastly in this area of SIS um, substitutes, there is a slightly mysterious animal uh, lurking in the jungle called ILEAP, the International Law Enforcement Alert Platform. 
I think this is a gleam in the eye of UK policing at the moment. Um, it's supposed to be a new platform for sharing alerting beyond the UK and the EU to include others like the Americans um, and to have much greater functionality, but it's at least two to three years away, we were told. And in my experience of government IT systems, two to three years away can mean quite a long time away, in fact. So that is clearly an area to watch carefully. Um, for the future, therefore, uh, it seems to me that we have got a pretty good situation in most of the areas at the moment. I think we need careful scrutiny of how that continues over time. Um, quite a lot of it, I think, depends on good operational cooperation between those who know each other well by having worked closely together as members of the EU. As we begin to lose that personal connectivity, will the arrangement still work so well? Um, will they be affected by wider political tensions in the relationship? I think yes, inevitably, if they continue at the current level that they are. Um, will the surrender arrangements actually work in the real life of courts and legal systems across EU countries? There's a lot of quite novel material in there. And uh, we've been told that so far there doesn't seem to be any fall off in the uh, numbers of people being surrendered and for whom we're seeking surrender, but the numbers are a bit hard to come by. And um, subject to Baroness Hamwe's views, I think in our new Lords Committee, I think we will be keeping all that under careful scrutiny. Just very briefly, can I touch on two other things? One is a slightly under-discussed area, which is about justice cooperation, but not law enforcement cooperation. And that is the whole area of um, private and family law which we touch on in, in our committee report. By leaving the EU, we left the two Brussels regulations, Brussels one on the civil and commercial uh, law framework and Brussels two on family law and, and parental responsibility. Brussels one enabled British citizens to pursue um, breach of contract cases, for example, um, across the EU. Now they have to fall back on the national laws of each individual EU country, more expensive, longer, more delays, more complex for small businesses and civilian um, individuals with claims against EU companies. I think even worse, the situation in family law, where um, uh, we have lost access to the um, Brussels regulation, um, and therefore in terms of families in crisis, um, with very difficult issues about divorce, enforcement and maintenance orders, child custody. They are having to fall back on the Hague Conventions of the 1960s, unfamiliar in EU courts now. Again, more uncertainty, more delay, very unsatisfactory in the case of the welfare of children. So that's an area, as I say, not law enforcement, but is judicial cooperation. And lastly, before I shut up, just two minutes on the state of UK-French relations, which Julian um, suggested I might have a view on. Indeed, I do. Um, I think they are worse than I can remember at any time in my career, um, certainly worse than 2003 over the Iraq war. Um, there is a fundamental loss of trust in Paris towards the British government and their reliability, uh, whether they can be taken at their word. Uh, we can see that rippling across into things like fisheries, but also the migration issues across the channel, which are UK French bilateral, but I think are very likely to make more difficult cooperation across um, the wider UK EU area. And in uh, foreign security, defense policy, the UK and France are wider apart than we've been for many, many years. So I don't think that context is at all helpful for preserving the sort of good operational cooperation that I've been talking about in this area. We can discuss all that in questions, Ben. I should just say I need to leave slightly before 12 o'clock because I've got to chair another Zoom call starting at 12, um, but I look forward to questions up to about 10 to 12. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Lord Ricketts. We're very grateful for your sharing those insights and also helping to link this panel to the keynote as well. So our next speaker will now hand over to uh, Baroness Sally Hamwee, uh, the Baroness is a Liberal Democrat member of the House of Lords, Chair of the Justice and Home Affairs Select Committee, and was previously the Lib Dem Lords uh, spokesperson on Home Affairs. So, Baroness Hamwee, uh, over to you. Thank you so much. 
thank you very much. And can you tell me if you stop hearing me, which might be a relief because I, my connection seems to be coming and going. You can't always get what you want and you might have wanted or at least expected me to have a rather grander backdrop than this. I am in the House of Lords, but not the elaborate part of the palace. This is what an office shared by 11 peers looks like. You can't see my clutter because of the way where the camera is. That's other people's clutter behind you, me. Um, you might, of course, always get a lot of what you don't want, which is um, something I'm going to um, say a word about. I am, as has, you've said, chair of the very new, um, only since uh, Easter, Justice and Home Affairs Committee. The Lords has not had select committees looking at these issues before, and so you'll appreciate that's a pretty wide uh, remit. But I am speaking personally. I don't think that the other members would disagree with a great deal of what I'm going to say, though I'm sure that they would put it in the more moderate language, which I always find so cheering when I hear coming from people like Peter and, and Julian. And I'm a Liberal Democrat, so I'm not speaking for the government. Peter has mentioned um, particularly the family law area. Um, we are not members of Lug the Lugano Convention, we may become so. Um, we're worried that um, uh, this seems to be in a sort of state of stasis. We're urging the government to do what it can. The problems in the area may have been masked by COVID, which has slowed down a lot of operations, including court cases. Um, and most of the current cases started before we withdrew from the EU. But it is worrying. One of our committee members said we really should have made much more of a fuss about this when we saw the problem coming down the track. And I'll leave aside whether the role of a select committee is to be a campaigning group. I'm not sure how much more would have been possible, though we should actually you know, try and learn from, from that. The legal and academic world in both the UK and the EU was very clear about the potential problems. We don't know if we'll get what we want. And to pick up points made earlier this morning about entitlement and exceptionalism, and also about the context in which we're working, I think it's salutary for the UK to find that we're not as indispensable as we liked to present ourselves. That colleague said that the lessons from Lugano are to make a fuss when no one's taking enough notice about something. So I'm going to talk about some of the EU border arrangements, which will apply from sometime next year, we don't yet know when, which the committee fears could be troublesome. The first time ETIAS, E-T-I-A-S, was mentioned, I heard that as Etihad, which could be something to do with my being a Manchester City supporter. Um, whenever I've said Etihad, or Etihad, you see I'm getting confused again, Etias to friends, they've said, what? You're such a well-informed group. Forgive me if I'm talking down about the controls for entering the EU, which will be the European Travel Information and Authorization System, that's ETIAS, which is authorization to enter, and the EES, European Entry and Exit System, which is the one which is likely to have most impact, certainly the most immediate impact, recording entry and exit using biometrics at the border. ETIAS will provide for authorization in advance. So at the border, not only the UK that's affected, but we have particularly large numbers who travel to the EU. 
in 2019, there were something like 5.7 million visits, visits, not visitors, but visits to the US, so including people who went more than once. In the same period, 67 million visits from the UK into the EU. We have juxtaposed controls with the UK and France having their controls close together on UK soil for Eurostar, uh, the tunnel and the port of Dover. And this is where we think the trouble can be. I, I suspect there are going to be problems um, for air passengers arriving in the EU, but they will be at European airports. Who knows about it? Well, the transport operators do, but they have been struggling to engage with the authorities and they're really very worried. Um, the committee uh, took evidence a few days ago from the three operators. Eurostar say that they need an area the size of the whole area in front of their current check-in at St Pancras to operate the new controls. Now that's where passengers queue so now. So where would we all go? Eurotunnel say that they will need to process about 1,700 people an hour in the summer peak, but processing includes taking fingerprints. That can't be done inside a car. They said that suggesting that people got out of their cars would be like asking them to get out of a toll booth on a motorway and would be really dangerous. Added to which, it needs EU officials to deal with all this. The Dover Port Authority and Eurotunnel are squeezed between the, well, I was going to say the white cliffs, apparently they're green at this point, but the cliffs and the sea with a high-speed line Folkestone and Dover taking up space, there's just no room to expand and that's leaving aside the infrastructure that would be needed and the cost of disruption of all of that. The committee heard that lorry drivers are actually quite disciplined when there's a backlog, they're simply resigned to queuing on the motorway, but that's not the case with the general public because a lot of drivers think that they can be clever, find a way around. Um, but of course, they cause more congestion by doing that, and the congestion spreads through Kent. Um, they, their passengers, um, their children, grandparents, dogs, you know, they're all getting out, causing problems, no doubt for the driver. And a great deal of frustration and anger is caused. So those are some of the practical problems. Add in legal and ethical considerations. For ETS, the authorization system, a lot of information has to be provided. So you rapidly get to thinking about profiling. Will people be, um, prevented or delayed uh, from getting into the EU? What if you answer the question, have you recently traveled to a conflict area? You're a journalist, so you have, but are you then investigated further because you might be a terrorist? What are the assumptions that are made? I don't need to go into the ethic, the um, ethnic and, and religious questions that, that might come up. How is, how is our data protected? What rights of appeal are there? And in particular, how is the appeal to be dealt with apparently by the individual member states, but you're here, they're there, how do you engage with it? There is so little information in the public domain I don't think the British public will get what it expects because it was used to seamless travel to the EU. Its patience is becoming exhausted with the experience of the COVID uh, restrictions. And I think they'll expect to see the back of 
long forms and long queues, and they won't expect an authorization system which is similar to applying for a visa when they're just going for a, a short holiday. So I think it's incumbent on the government to reach out to the EU and seek to become involved in how all this will work. I'm not suggesting challenging the principles, but contributing to a smooth operation and to raise awareness, because it shouldn't just be, as we've been told so far, for the EU Commission to raise awareness and deal with all this, nor should it be for the transport operators. The Home Office should be, and I'm using a word I hate actually, to be proactive on behalf of the UK citizens. The other um, area where the UK government may be getting what it wants, uh, but it might find its outcomes are not wholly what it are anticipated, and it's also border management, and I'm here gloomier than others, and that is uh, immigration um, and visas. Truck drivers, well, we've had that, we're told we've got to grow our own, uh, seasonal workers, apparently we will get turkeys for Christmas, um, but will the, the daffodils in Cornwall be um, unpicked next year? And what about the apples rotting on the ground? Um, if an issue makes it into the archers, we know it's serious. Uh, more importantly for me, um, refugees and asylum seekers, I was an enthusiastic Remainer, but I recognise that my team came second and we've got to make the result work. I hoped that Global Britain would be about cooperation, partnership, not failing to strive for a good relationship with a near neighbour, not constructing an immigration policy which seems to be based on everyone else should sort out most of this. Asylum seekers are not required to stay in a safe country through which uh, they've traveled. We mentioned France, Greece is overloaded. One can go through, through the list. We're an island, the countries around us are safe. So anybody coming under their own or other the smugglers steam are in the government's terms almost certainly to be illegal. Well, the smugglers are illegal, people, asylum seekers are not. The Refugee Council has published a report this week with information which is directly contrary to the Home Office, the Home Secretary's statement to the committee a few days ago that 70% of people on small boats are single men who are economic migrants. My understanding has long been that it's young men who are likely to make perilous, appalling journeys to seek asylum first, maybe. Um, I don't want to get into the, I could get into the argument about pull factors. But I don't know how the Home Office thinks that you can get here by a regular route from Iran, from Vietnam, from the Yemen, and so on. David Blunkett, who was Home Secretary and who's a member of, of our committee, said to the Home Secretary, and I'm quoting from the transcript of the evidence, I just get the impression that if you're properly documented and have been able to come in your, that's the Home Secretary's terms, legally, you will not be granted asylum because you're clearly not at risk. If you are at risk and you've escaped and you don't, do not have the documentation, you will not be admissible. Well, there's a contradiction, a dilemma that we need to um, investigate further. And we don't know what the legal basis is for turning back small boats, though we're assured that there is one. I'm not for a moment suggesting this is easier. 
And of course, there will always be economic migrants. And I don't think it's a disgrace to seek a better life. My grandparents did, and I'm very lucky not to have been born in Aleppo. I'm very conscious of that. But my view is that the government should be taking the lead in advocating the benefits that refugees bring. So withdrawal is not what I or the Liberal Democrats wanted. The EU was not notably successful before we left in responding to refugees, but we've lost an opportunity. And with border management as in the government's current policy, which I think is bound to fail, we're going to lose public trust in the UK as well. And that alone is a very high price to pay. And I'll add, something that somebody else put in my mind earlier this morning at a personal level inaccurate language a language that's cheapened like illegal people that's really insidious that lowers our own standards i resent that very much indeed thank you Okay, thank you very much, Baroness Hamwe, for those uh, remarks. Um, our next speaker uh, seems to be joining us from the cliffside somewhere. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Christian Cownett. Uh, Christian is a Professor of International Security at Dublin City University in Ireland, Professor of Policing and Security and Director of the International Centre for Policing and Security at the University of South Wales, and also Director of the Jean Monnet Network on EU Counterterrorism. So, Christian, very pleased to have you here, and, and maybe you can tell us whether the puffins behind you are, are South Wales puffins or Irish puffins. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. That's It's a great pleasure to be there with you today. I think it's uh, such an important topic, and I'm greatly honoured to come after such distinguished speakers before me. So thank you for having me. Thank you for the kind introductions. And indeed, I think those are meant to be um, both Irish and Welsh puffins. So um, I hope that they are appropriately bringing the two Celtic nations together there. So I hope this is also one of those uh, contributions that I can make today. Um, the topic of my talk, and in, indeed Helena, who kindly invited me um, to this round table, already alluded to the, to the article that we published last year in EFA. Um, I want to, in a sense, try and give an answer to the suggestion that you can't always get what you wanted. Because if we look at the history of EU membership for the United Kingdom, in particular in the area of freedom, security, and justice, but of course, also uh, more generally, I think for most of its history, we can give the answer that the United Kingdom did get most of what it wanted most of the time. Um, whether this is still the case with the withdrawal agreement, and I, again, I, I agree with uh, the previous speaker, Lord Ricketts, who suggested that the withdrawal agreement is better than what might have been expected, but of course, it falls far short of what the UK negotiation position was at the outset. It is quite a tremendous um, way away from, from what the objectives were at the beginning. But let me just frame my talk a little bit. And it comes a little bit in, in relation to the discussions that we've had in, in international relations and in political science on exceptionalism in global politics. Um, this has been uh, very much applied to a number of different um, countries' foreign policy. This has been applied to US foreign policy, where there's a whole body of literature in terms of exceptionalism. This has also been applied to foreign policy of other countries, such as China, India, Turkey, and of course, others. I think it fits extremely well in relation to what British behavior, if you like, was as a member of the European Union, in particular in the area of just and home affairs, I think that's a particularly good example of that. In our um, article, we wrote about how this exceptionalist uh, behavior that characterized the UK's relationship with the EU that was particularly pronounced in the area of just and home affairs or area of freedom, security, and justice. In fact, 
it is reliant as a good social constructivist on both UK's own perception in that it always uh, suggested and, and perhaps also did made an exceptional contribution to European security. Certainly there's a lot of good historical examples that we could mention that, but it also relies on other EU partners agreeing with this um, contention and of course having accommodated the United Kingdom for many decades in, in that belief. If we want to, we could suggest that, um, of course, amongst some of the Brexiteers, and in particularly pronounced during the negotiations, we could see that idea encapsulated by a statement that I'm sure you're very familiar with, they need us more than we need them, which is something that has been mentioned many, many times. Um, but even amongst those that are pro EU in the debate and have been voting for Remain and so on. I'm going to mention a couple of examples where this belief also shines through. Um, in general, we can say that since the um, referendum where the United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union, while before that referendum in the EU, other member states on the whole largely accommodated those beliefs and largely partially also agreed with them, I think we have seen a shift since the referendum where this accommodation has been less and less um, entertained. Now, initially, of course, the UK uh, rejected membership of the European Union, if you remember, in the 1950s. At the time, um, there was, of course, the discourse about the UK not joining because of the uh, Commonwealth, first empire, later than, of course, the Commonwealth. Um, but despite that, when the United Kingdom entered the European Union, it quickly became a very, very important player. And of course, the area of justice and home affairs is a, is a very good example, notably the area of counterterrorism. That is something that I've published a lot about. The United Kingdom has been really at the forefront of a lot of initiatives. If we just look at the EU's counterterrorism strategy, many, many observers have suggested that in fact it is um, very similar to the, uh, to the one that was adopted in the United Kingdom already prior to the EU strategy. But I think what characterized that relationship relatively early on is, of course, um, this belief that the United Kingdom does things differently to other European countries, and therefore um, the normal rules of the game, as it were, uh, don't really apply. We can go back to the whole um, Schengen debate, because if we if we just look at why is Schengen called Schengen, it comes back to a British idea, which was very much this insistence on not wanting to establish freedom of movement with the abolition of border controls inside the framework of the European Union. As a result of that, the other member states, such as uh, France, Germany, and others, went outside of the framework of the European Union, only to bring it back into the framework of the European Union later. It then continued in terms of the UK's insistence that this should be the so-called third pillar, rather than should be a community policy area, which was very much at the heart of the Maastricht debate, and the UK very much um, on the on the position that it should only be a, a different style, a different type of legal arrangement for this particular area. It then led to the variety of opt-out, opt-in uh, discussions that we've had over the last couple of years. And I think symbolically, and that's what I wanted to suggest that this also concerns pro-EU politicians, if we just go back to the signing of the Lisbon Treaty and Remember, um, Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who at the time signed the Lisbon Treaty for the United Kingdom on behalf of the United Kingdom, the symbolism of his signing was very much um, of the UK being a part because he chose not to participate in the signing with all, EU other, all other EU member states. He chose to sign the treaty in a separate room where there would only be pictures taken of him signing, but without uh, much of a connection to anybody else in the European Union. So this is what I mean about um, this feeling of being quite exceptional, being prevalent in all elements of the political debate. 
even if we look at um, Prime Minister Tony Blair, who at the time very much suggested the UK should play a very, very important role inside the European Union, and of course at the time also was in favour of joining the Euro and a number of other things. Um, we also see that even during those times, there were of course, um, I feel like there was a certain willingness to be a part that was also characterised, of course, in a debate about the war in Iraq. But nonetheless, despite all of that, during the time that the UK was a member of the European Union, we can quite clearly see that it managed to establish a very privileged position in that institution of the European Union. It pretty much got a kind of a legal arrangement a la carte. The UK could opt in when it wanted to. It was also able to opt out when it wanted to. And it was the only country, in fact, that had this combination of opt-in, opt-outs in a way in which it suited uh, the governments of the day um, more than any other country, because we, of course we have also opt-ins, opt-outs uh, in the Republic of Ireland. We also have that in Denmark to a certain extent, but the variety and the uh, scope of opt-in, opt-outs that the United Kingdom had acquired during that time uh, is of course unsurpassed. There is no other member state that had quite the a la carte uh, menu that the UK had during the time of its membership. Now, when it came then to the issue of Brexit and the referendum, there were a number of things that um, were still desired. We see that, of course, the UK, uh, as previous speakers also pointed out, wanted similar capabilities as it had as a member state. We I just need to mention the European Criminal Records Information System, ECRIS, Schengen Information System. Of course, there wasn't any precedent for an EU member state, non-Schengen state here to have those kind of arrangements. Um, there's also a number of documents that were then produced. We, we have, for instance, a document framework for the UK EU security partnership that produced a number of objectives here, discussions for the EU negotiators. But certainly when we look at um, the current incumbent in terms of negotiating with the EU, um, uh, David Frost, he suggested at some point to, to Michel Barnier, the EU negotiator, that on law enforcement, where you described the EU proposals as providing for an unprecedentedly close relationship, but in fact, they do not go beyond agreements you've made with other third countries, many of whom have far less data to offer the EU and less closely involved and a mutual fight against crime. This is just to suggest that this thinking that of course the UK is better than any other third country is still at the heart of even the, the, the current um, thinking in terms of negotiations. At the time, Michel Barnier of course warned that the UK was making far too high demands uh, of the European Union. And of course, um, when we look at the outcome, we agree that you know the outcome could have been far worse certainly if we look at other areas like common foreign security policy clearly the outcomes are far worse but the outcomes are also far off what uk negotiators initially were hoping to achieve so i think in in conclusion what this in a sense suggests is that while um, the idea of exceptionalism, of course, relies on a certain self-perception, on a certain um, material dimensions, of course. Uh, the UK legal system is very significantly different from continental legal systems, and as a result of that, materially, there's a good argument to be made that there's a certain difference that needs to be respected. Um, Brexit has also, to an extent, put an end to other EU member states' willingness and partially also uh, their legal capabilities to entertain all of those kind of issues. If I should just point out on the European arrest warrant, and in fact, it was pointed out that of course, um, the European Court of Justice recently made a very important decision with regards to the Republic of Ireland. But if we look at, for instance, the German Constitutional Court, we can quite clearly say, should the German Constitutional Court remain true to its prior verdicts that it has made on the European arrest warrant in, in question, um, 
it is very difficult to see that uh, it would agree with that verdict of the European Court of Justice. It is very difficult to see that it is compatible with prior verdicts of the German Constitutional Court, which very clearly said that, for instance, the extradition of German nationals to non-EU countries is completely against the German Constitution. And therefore, no matter what the withdrawal agreement says, it doesn't hold the same status in German constitutional law as, of course, the EU treaties would have, because the only reason the German Constitutional Court eventually agreed to the European arrest warrant was because of that one article in the German Constitution, which is that it has to interpret everything in relation to the idea that it contributes to European integration. The withdrawal agreement is, of course, the opposite of that. So um, to end on the note, I think both legal capabilities and political willingness in other EU member states are far more limited now. So the idea of the UK as an exceptional power in this particular area is significantly reduced. It hasn't ended because, of course, there's still significant and important capability that capabilities that the UK can bring to the table, but the acceptance of other EU member states has been significantly reduced. So thank you very much. I'll end on this note and I look forward to our questions and answers. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Kanner, for that uh, succinct overview of British exceptionalism and its implications for uh, justice and home affairs. So our next and final speaker is um, uh, Professor Elaine Fahey. Uh, Professor Fahey is uh, Jean Monnet Chair of Law and Transatlantic Relations and Professor of Law at the Institute for the Study of European Law at City Law School at the University of London, uh, and also the author of the uh, very relevant volume for our discussion on Brexit, Law, Justices and Injustices. So uh, thank you so much, Professor Fahey, and over to you. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Benjamin, uh, for your very generous introduction and to uh, Lena and to uh, Sarah for all their fantastic organisation. Could I just check that you're able to see my slides um, OK, my screen OK? Yep, we can. Super. So I, I apologise in advance. I, I am a lawyer and I'm going to give you a very lawyerly presentation, but I'm going, I, I'm going to speak about the p &R aspects, the passenger name records aspects of the Brexit agreement, which in my opinion certainly are legally some of the most explosive provisions of the agreement and extremely dangerous uh, in the sense that the UK has certainly achieved a very uh, positive outcome, but from an EU law perspective there is an enormous questions about the future of this going forward and it's a very difficult area of law you know, in general, but I think it also, the, the framing of this shows the rush uh, with which the uh, negotiators, uh, uh, pr pr you know, prevailed at the, at the time, and um, just generally, um, you know, what is really extraordinary about this piece of the Brexit negotiations is that it's a uniquely legally proofed area. It's extraordinarily detailed and comprehensive to find this in a trade agreement, and it institutionalizes passenger name records in a way never done before in any EU trade agreement in recent times. And there are many, many legal concerns about the extent to which this, the Brexit agreement implements the uh, EU-Canada decision on passenger name records there. With another very developed economy, the Canadians have extremely sophisticated constitutional law, some of the best in the world, in fact. So, I mean, there is an argument to make that this is one of the most legally vulnerable parts of the Brexit agreement, and that there's a very outsized role here for executive dominance, a partnership council, and, and real questions about institutions, but you know, just any oversight generally, how we understand oversight in the UK, given the very toxic debate against rights, the GDP war, data, data rights. And data is mentioned literally you know, hundreds and thousands of times in the Brexit agreement. It's an extraordinary agreement, despite being a very thin trade agreement, is also extremely modern. And you know, just really, really quickly, I look like I've lost the slides, but I just want to, because uh, you know, I know many people are not lawyers, and I just want to be as clear as possible, but I hope you, you I'm not trying to, 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 to put too much data in this, but you know, just telling that there's about 20 odd years of, of law that's emerged after post 9-11, the commission adopting a global approach to PNOR, there's agreements with the uh, Australia, a, a lot of agreements with the US that are really complex, but, but Canada emerged you know, a, as an extremely interesting barometer of complexity with um, the Court of Justice deciding just very recently that an agreement with Canada could not be signed in its current form. And there's, there's currently a lot of work going 
on as to how to deal with Canada, how to implement the court's decision. And Japan is the other major developed economy that the EU has a trade agreement with uh, and a strategic partnership agreement and, and negotiations are ongoing now as to p &R. And there's you know, many, many complexities as to EU-Japan relations on data. So why is the Brexit agreement a big deal? What, what is so interesting about it? Well, it's really interesting legally because the p &R agreement, the parts of this you know, uniquely follow every word for word, as it were, verbatim as much as possible, the court's decision of a, a decision on as to EU Canada's purpose limitation, the scope of it, non-discrimination, transparency, automated processing, data retention, and so on. So we might say ostensibly there's an effort to slavishly follow the court's decision, but there's you know, also many other complexities. So just very, very briefly, what do the court decide in the EU Canada agreement? Why I get so excited about all of this. Well, the Parliament, European Parliament, sought an opinion of the court on the validity of the agreement in 2014. And in 2017, the court upheld the idea that surveillance could be used as, as a tool to prevent terrorism, but there had to be very strict rules as to how to implement it. And you'll see, I tried to underline here, there's the key passages, but the, the court kept on saying the agreement was not doing what was strictly necessary as to the use of data. And the court said that a five-year period to retain data um, was okay, that was, that was absolutely legally fine, but there were many questions about the retention, the use of data after passengers had departed the, the jurisdiction as to what was strictly necessary. There were issues as to the disclosure of data you know, going beyond what was strictly necessary. There were questions about the legitimate interests of the individual and exceeding what was necessary. And there were questions about this, this big question of oversight and compliance with the rules what was sufficiently clear and precise and what was not. So on its face, the court said that it, it was an oversight was, was not uh, correctly or, or well set out. Okay, so, so just generally, what, what's really remarkable, about, this is the uh, screenshot of, of the, the Brexit agreement, um, everything to do with passenger name records is in Title Three, and it's in 20 articles, which alone is an extraordinarily large number of, of articles to have in, in a trade agreement. And what's really interesting, are the definitions in Article uh, 534 on the competent authority to process data and the passenger information units to, to, uh, to, to, to be responsible for this. And you'll see there's a very clear statement in Article 544 that, you know, that the use of, of data has to be strictly for the purposes of preventing, detecting, investigating, or prosecuting serious crime. So you might say, well, is this lip service or is this really explicitly an attempt to confine data to the most absolutely precise contours? And you'll see that the agreement provides that the retention of data shall not be for more than five years. We just saw in Canada that the court said that was fine. And you'll see that it's very important, extremely important in um, paragraph sub seven here. An independent administrative body has to assess on a yearly basis the approach applied by the UK competent authority on the need to retain data. And there's some exceptions to that, but that, that's clearly a very important provision. Another hugely important provision is Article 556 on the disclosure of data outside the UK, that the UK cannot disclose PNOR data to public authorities in other countries, except if the data is disclosed to public authorities in paragraph A, if the purposes are set out, if it's disclosed on a case-by-case -case basis, B, C, necessary for the purposes as described above, with a minimum amount of data and third country. Anyway, whatever about the the, the, the actual, you know, the wording of this, you'll see there's lots of situations where data can be further disclosed. And it might be in you know, quite precise parameters relative to the judgment, but still there's a lot, lot of issues here. There's also a, a very key provision on the suspension of the title for a variety of reasons, a very powerful tool, but it sets out the, the provisions to go forward there. And there's some aspects of consultation um, to, to go through uh, before this happens. I think another really you know, broader question is just the general, the partnership council powers us to data, the very executive dominance here, what role parliamentary committees will assume in raising these issues, whether strictly within their mandate or not. And you know, in, in short, there could be many questions here as to, as to the framing of this. But I thought what's really, really interesting about the Brexit agreement is that right after it was drafted, this document was leaked online. I think at least it was leaked. It's, it's hundreds of pages of questions that the member states had for the commission on the, the Brexit uh, agreement itself. And you'll see that you know, lots of the, answer, the questions from the member states are in, in the middle column that I've underlined some of them and everything on the right 
is what the, the commission says. And I'll talk with you very quickly, but what's really interesting here is the commission gives lots of very bland diplomatic answers, generally trying to assuage the concerns of the member states. But the member states in the PNR are part of the agreement ask the same questions over and over again. And you see the first question is there, you know, is this really in line with Canada? The second question there in the second box of the, the bottom half of the screen, can you clarify what is a competent authority or an independent administrative body? And you'll see that on, on the bottom right, the, um, the, the commission is trying to say that they, they, these are um, the competent authority and independent administrative bodies are different. Their independence is important. It's required. There is an assessment on a, a yearly uh, basis required. You'll see the questions get asked over and over again, the same questions. What is a competent authority? What is an independent body? Are they the same? And that's the first question there at the top and the right inside the commission says no. Then there's public health risks justifying disclosure identified in, in the agreement and the commission's asked about this. And you'll see in the bottom right hand side and say, well, yes, this, this is okay. There are other situations where this is somewhat comparably uh, provided for lot, lots of people dispute that. Some interesting questions raised by the member states um, at, at the bottom here of, of this screen, you know, to what extent can EU um, you know, counterparts of the UK is the reciprocal obligations as to the transfer of data, for example, as to the public health risk issue. And you'll see that there's, they say, no, this, the commission says, no, this is only as to the UK. Um, and there's some very interesting questions here, uh, you know, the use of data after six months. I don't want to go through them all, but I'm just trying to, to flag for you that this is an extraordinary large number of very specific questions, despite the alleged um, you know, uh, alignment of this agreement with the Canada decision. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop kind of on the, the legalese there, but what is very important to say is that the Parliament, European Parliament, uh, passed a, a very significant resolution earlier this year asking the Commission to uh, monitor the use of mass surveillance technologies in the UK and urge the Commission to amend the UK adequacy decisions and you'll see the adequacy decision of, of, of earlier this year is very much predicated on the, on, on the basis of the UK GDPR law being based on EU legislation. But there are, of course, like significant carve outs for immigration and a sunset clause that all of this you know, will die in a few years time has to be reviewed. And I think you can't put it better than Eduardo Celeste's in an interesting piece on this. That the UK adequacy decision is subject to a time bomb. The case of the Court of Justice has become more and more solid and clear in relation to the incompatibility of various practices adopted by national security authorities. This makes the general transfer mechanism based on adequacy unstable and uh, unreliable. And of course, the UK has planned, planned a bonfire of, of EU law, uh, allegedly in, in most recent weeks, very inflammatory terms. Uh, uh, this idea that retained EU laws is no longer to be retained, and the GDPR in particular is a, is a bureaucracy to be departed from, despite extraordinary amounts of, of, of business consumers, you know, individuals lobbying to, to, to retain the framework generally of compliance. And I suppose so. some general questions just to raise, and this is part of a, a project that I'm starting to do with um, with some people in, in Queen Mary, uh, Professor Elspeth Guild in particular. Um, you know, what, what is the depth of oversight of this? You know, it's very difficult to find any information uh, about this, uh, you know, and, and we're, we're looking for the importance of independent assessment. Um, it's not featuring anywhere. How do we understand the, the idea of, of, of true review? Uh, how do we understand its interaction with many other EU data transfer agreements? And there's a huge commission review of all adequacy decisions next year. How that impacts upon this, I think, will be uh, very interesting to play out. How does the vast apparatus of passenger name records agreement sit in the post Schrems II world? There's, there's you know, real concerns about how the EU and US are going to implement the privacy shield outcomes of, of the, the, the Schrems decisions. And who's going to litigate this? Who can sue? Is redress real? It's very, very difficult, very modest. And what's the role in particular of EU institutions here? Because the TCA institution actors seem extremely, yeah, it, 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 very embryonic and, and not there yet, despite you know, some, some possibilities. Very difficult for the European Parliament to challenge this. Will they do that? Will they use their political capital after, after EU Canada? Will they use it for EU Japan? Is Japan a better target than, than, the, e, than the UK? What are the limits of this? And, and, and just generally how compatible is all of this with you law, um, but I, you know, I, I sound very negative and I, throughout all of this, but it is a very um, positive institutionalization of the architecture of, of PNR to have this much data or this much agree, you know, detail 
on this in the agreement, but of course it raises many other questions when, when data is the new oil or gas, if you like, is the hottest topic in the, in the world and also the most sensitive. And I'll stop there. I hope I'm within time. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Fahey. Yes, absolutely within time. And thank you so much for that detailed presentation. OK, so we've got exactly 30 minutes left in this session, which means we have uh, plenty of time for questions and answers. Uh, I can see that we've got some questions in the chat already. Um, for those in the audience, this is a really uh, a wonderful opportunity. We have four very senior uh, legislators and scholars here ready to answer our questions. Um, so if you do have queries or comments, please do post them in the chat uh, and I will put them to uh, the panel. Uh, so maybe let me start out. We have a first question uh, from Christian Turner at the University of Surrey, uh, who asks this a question for uh, Lord Ricketts. Uh, would the UK be better placing efforts in building security networks and partnerships that bring together both the EU and non-EU member states? Um, you touched on the, co and the notion of coalition building in a broader sense in your recent book, or would it be better placed to seek to strengthen existing provisions and institutions such as Interpol an attempt to uh, renegotiate access to uh, EU systems. Um, so, and, and there's another a question as well uh, for you, Lord Ricketts. So maybe I'll read that out now and we can take that as well. Um, and Agatha Piquet asks, uh, could we expect the French presidency of the EU to impact EU-UK relations due to the current tensions between the two countries and considering the upcoming French presidential uh, elections. Um, so maybe Lord Ricketts, if you if you would like to respond to those now. Yes, certainly. Um, and thank you very much also to the to the other presenters. Just before I do, I, I wanted to underline one point that Christian Kaunert made about British exceptionalism. Uh, and indeed, I think Baroness Hamwe started this trend as well. I mean, in my view, uh, an exceptionalist view of the world runs through the current British government's policy like uh, words through a stick of rock. I mean, it, is, it seems to me to be fundamental to the whole um, Brexit argument that Britain is somehow you know, exceptional and still largely a great power. And the rhetoric of foreign policy pronouncements is constantly um, full of rather boastful claims that Britain will be a soft power superpower and a science and technology superpower and the leading European security power and so on. Um, and so I don't think there's anything exceptional in an exceptionalist approach in the area of justice and home affairs. Um, and indeed, what strikes me, as I said in my contribution, is that actually the UK was willing to negotiate a very detailed legal agreement on these issues, unlike in many other areas of foreign and security and defence policy, where it shunned anything at all from a rather exceptionalist uh, approach um, to not wanting to trammel Britain's future relationship with the world, I suppose, not letting the EU-UK relationship get in the way of global Britain. Um, although I would argue that it's fundamental to global Britain to have a working relationship with the EU. Um, uh, on the issue of um, should, would we be better off pursuing wider networks of cooperation rather than um, sort of strengthening our EU-UK links? I mean, I think we have to do all of that. Um, much security cooperation already happens in wider frameworks, whether on uh, counterterrorism or cyber security or indeed intelligence sharing and the UK is very well plugged into those networks such as Five Eyes but uh, the actual cooperation between law enforcement and justice authorities with the EU is so law bound that I think it's essential that the UK stays in close touch with the development of EU policy in all these JHA areas, because one of the threats to what was achieved in the TCA seems to me to be the evolution of EU regulation and law with the UK not following it and um, a growing gap developing between the two. I think that would be risky for the UK. So I think we should be doing both, both working on the wider canvas, but also specifically to keep up to date with um, the trend of EU policymaking. Um, and then uh, to Agat's question about um, the implications for the UK of France taking on the presidency and, of course, the upcoming French presidential election, I think they're slightly different things. The French presidential election seems to me to give uh, Emmanuel Macron some incentive to certainly not look weak in his handling of the UK and, if possible, to come out looking strong and resolute in handling issues like the fisheries dispute where fishermen have such 
political resonance in France. Um, I am not sure, to be honest, how much um, influence an EU presidency will have on UK EU um, future framework negotiations. They have, as everyone knows on the call, been very much handled through the Commission, now by Commissioner Sefcovic, I think doing a very professional job. And member states have tended, it seems to me, to stand back from that. Of course, in the presidency, the French will have an agenda setting role. We can't expect them to push EU UK issues towards the top of that agenda. They'd have no interest in that. Um, and it is not helpful, certainly, to be having a major political row with the French at the time when the French are acceding to the EU presidency for the next six months. That doesn't help Britain's cause at all, I don't think, no. OK, wonderful. Thank you so much. So we've got two more questions from Agat. Um, so first is, uh, what can we learn from the UK's decision to send troops uh, in Poland to support Frontex? Is it a signal or symbol of its uh, willingness to maintain some cooperation with the EU? Uh, and the second question is uh, specifically uh, for uh, Elaine Fahey. Uh, you mentioned uh, TCA institutions to be quite embryonic. Could we expect anything from the Joint Parliamentary Assembly in terms of oversight of freedom? security and justice um, and so could, could, could I just answer the one on Poland perhaps because in my national security hat um, very briefly I, you know then I wouldn't want to answer any more questions to, to monopolize uh, um, I'd be interested if others on the call know um, the, um, the legal base for the UK sending these troops to Poland I suspect it has nothing to do with Frontex or the EU and that it will be um, a bilateral UK-Polish step, possibly under the NATO framework, if anything at all. Um, uh, I'd be very surprised if there was any um, overtones of the UK sending troops to support Frontex. So I suspect it's being presented as a bilateral UK-Poland initiative, rather to show the independence and agility of UK defence policy making now, uh, rather than something which we might interpret as you know, as a bit of a signal of moderation towards cooperation with the EU, but others on the call may know better than me. Okay, thank you. So I, I know we have questions as well from uh, Lena Farrand Karapika. So I'm going to invite Lena onto the call now to ask her questions to the group. And then I'll suggest that we go uh, it, uh, through the speakers in reverse order, starting with uh, Professor Fahey. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, I just felt that it was easier for me to phrase them uh, orally because I have one for, for each member. Um, the, uh, before I actually go into the questions, I'd, I'd like to actually say, that, say that, uh, about the comment that uh, Ward uh, Ricketts just made that actually, I, I do think that is the case. I think that actually it, it is a bilateral, um, based on a bilateral agreement uh, relationship uh, with Poland, that actually it, it aligns really well uh, itself with um, with the uh, recent rhetoric that the the Prime Minister had in relation to um, the uh, in relation to the, the developments uh, um, uh, in terms of, of, of the judiciary uh, dis discussion that is taking place in Poland. So I think you know the Prime Minister spoke about that kind of the situation and support of, of came out in support of Poland. So I think it aligns itself quite well in terms of bilateral. Uh, um, arrangements. But if anyone else has, you know, any other insight into the possibility of, of supporting Frontex, please, please do so. Um, the um, questions, right. Um, my first question, so I, I go in the same order. Uh, Ward Ricketts, um, I think that I'd like to actually pick up on something that I thought was very, very important that you mentioned, which has to do with the personal connectivity uh, being an issue uh, going forward. So basically, as the, the relationship becomes less close actually there is a very important personal element that is lost which had to do with socialization uh, whether it's whether we're talking about members of parliament or whether we're talking about uh, practitioners so there's a whole element of socialization that used to actually take place where you learn from each other in terms of best practices exchange of best practices or even access to information understanding what is happening voicing concerns how can we actually compensate for that going forward for that loss of connectivity uh, for Baroness Hamley, uh, my question is about Ethias, but I just wanted to say how beautifully phrased uh, uh, you, 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 you phrased beautifully the issue of inaccurate language and how that actually affects the way we understand uh, uh, um, refugees, migrants, uh, and so how you know the issue of illegal people. Um, and so, um, if if you'd like to also actually answer uh, um, uh, the question about Poland, actually, you know. 
maybe slightly slightly phrased in terms of what what kind of message political message does it send to the uk in terms of our uh, uh, the fact that actually the prime minister is actually sending troops even if they're non-combatant troops right they're engineers what kind of message does it send about the way the uk is actually going forward in terms of thinking about migration uh, but that was actually not my main question for you my main question was uh, something that you mentioned about becoming proactive so how can the uk become involved and become more proactive uh, in the way uh, etias is being de uh, developed what kind of you know steps can we actually take uh, for professor christian Carnot, are there any indications that the UK's uh, uh, exceptionalist stance might be changing uh, uh, as relations deteriorate between the UK and the US? Is the UK government learning something from uh, this, uh, from the deterioration of the, um, of the relationships? My, my gut feeling is no, <laughs> but I would like to actually hear your, your thoughts about this. And uh, Professor Elaine Fahey, my question has to do with uh, uh, the issue of oversight that you mentioned. And I was just wondering about the UK EU Parliamentary Committee, if any, uh, I, I just heard from, from different speakers that actually there's issues relating to the development of that, of that uh, committee, uh, in particular on the UK side in terms of staffing that committee properly, which shows maybe some lack of willingness on the UK side to actually you know, properly, uh, uh, you know, uh, engage with this specific form of oversight. So uh, I'd just like to hear your, your, your views on this. Thank you very much to the entirety of the panel. Brilliant questions. Thank you so much, Lena. Um, so we'll, we'll go back through the panel in the reverse order, starting with Professor Fahey, uh, but just a, a quick appeal for members of the audience to post more uh, questions and, and to make the most of this opportunity. Um, so over to you, uh, Professor Fahey. Uh, th thank you so much for that. Thanks to, to Lane and um, Agatha. So it's a lot of really difficult questions. I think other people on the panel might be a lot better place to, to actually answer them. Um, you know, I, I, as far as I understand, just what, what, what Lena has said, that the institutional dimension to all of this is, is, is extremely ill-formed or just embryonic is, is there. There's, you know, um, in, certainly from my reading of it, there's you know, tremendous uh, potential for cooperation, but there's such a, a you know um, a, a low point in the relations, such a degree of um, um, yeah m m malaise about taking things forward. So uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's surprising that th that we are in the position where we are. But maybe I'm, I, you know, I'm just externally observing this, and I think other, particularly other, um, uh, the earlier speakers are much more prominently placed to to tell us about how how robust this could be in their view, or what's likely to change and. Um, you know, just in the question of, of oversight, if you want me to answer that, I mean, I, you know, this is, um, I, I think it's an extraordinary time, you know, the UK trying to potentially do a bonfire of law, bonfire of human rights law, bonfire of, uh, you know, council of, of ECHR law, um, uh, judicial review subject to a very politicised review as well to, you know, to get rid of every, every form of scrutiny, international scrutiny. I mean, the UK is really trying to cut itself off in human rights terms, or at least to, to control heavily the parameters of, of, of oversight of courts. So I think it'll be very difficult for the UK to be able to credibly argue if any of these decisions or actions are taken to their logical conclusion that you know, the, how to assess, you know, if, if you look at the language of, of the oversight part of the judgment of, of the EU calendar provisions, it's very worrisome, the rhetoric that, you know, courts are, you know, bad. And in this country, the UK, you know, most lawyers as well and academics and politicians seem to be obsessed with some voters' rights provisions of the ECHR. I mean, there's a huge jurisprudence on many other areas of law, data protection, you know, family rights, um, due process and so on, like this massive number of, it's the largest human rights instrument, um, you know, uh, in, in Europe, much larger than the EU, um, 47 member states. So it's, it's really sad to see continuous attack, I think, by Dominic Grab in recent times as well. Uh, you know, so I think it's very difficult to credibly argue oversight when you have such concern amongst the member states about what is a competent authority and, and very vivid concerns by the European Parliament as to, to all of this. So I, I'm afraid, to, sorry to, to sound so, so grim and whatever, maybe I'm completely misguided, but I think, you know, uh, certainly Lord, Lord Ricketts and, and uh, Baroness Hamley have, have a lot more insights to this, but yes, for, uh, there appears to be very embryonic provisions. They're likely to, to grant a lot of, um, you know, institutional uh, dynamics there, but I'll stop there if that's okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and over to uh, Professor Kaunas. Right, no, thank you for the questions. I think they're, they're, they're very interesting. In terms of 
indicators that the EU's exceptional, uh, that the UK's exceptional stance is in a sense lessening. I think in this particular area, we, we certainly cannot see those indicators as of yet. But I do think if we look at the larger picture, certainly if we look at the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol, I think what we do see in that debate, if you remember how the debate went, was that initially it was the UK very much threatening that we're going to pull the trigger here, we're going to uh, trigger Article 16 and so on. Um, and when the EU started putting all sorts of different news items out about possible trade wars and so on, then it was suddenly, ah, well, um, let's not raise the temperature here and let's kind of maybe calm down for now. So from that, I would deduce that perhaps the exceptionist stance is not as deeply held or as deeply felt as, as what is perhaps portrayed but that it is more of an instrumental argument that relies on a perception of the EU's weakness and on a perception that the EU is not particularly unified in their stance of rejecting uh, in, a, in a kind of uh, instrumentalist way that if you ask a lot, you get a lot. And I think on a number of subjects, this turned out to be not completely wrong. You know, in a number of areas, um, UK did get a number of things just by asking for a lot of them. But I do think there's clearly some limits. And I think this discussion has perhaps um, outlined some of the limits. So trying to uh, extrapolate from, from that debate onto, onto the area of freedom, security and justice, I would imagine that uh, there, there could be a point. And I certainly think when it touches the core essence of individual member states' constitutional orders, such as Germany, such as France, and so on, um, that could be the sort of limit of, of that argument. And I, and I think uh, most people in the government would realize that. And um, when it comes to Poland, I think it's something quite interesting going on there because there's two issues happening here at the same time. Now there's a so-called migration crisis at the Polish border with Belarus. And then there's the so-called migration crisis in the channel something that was of course totally predictable. And in fact, I remember a couple of years ago mentioning it to, to the Home Office that this is what is very likely to happen is a direct consequence of leaving the w Dublin regulation. This could not have been otherwise. Um, but of course, they're sort of linked now temporarily, but also logically, because of course the UK needs to show that it stops the migration flow at the Polish border in order to then make the claim we're keeping the border uh, safe in the channel. And, and of course, um, there's also the additional aspect to it, which is uh, the American warning that the Russians are building up troops also to the, to, uh, with regards to Ukraine and so on. So we're not only potentially talking about a so-called migration crisis, but we're also talking about a possible Russian incursion in Ukraine. So I think this fulfills both purposes. So I think that's probably why we're seeing that. I don't think it's only directed um, towards the Polish border, but it's probably also directed uh, with regards to the uh, migration crisis in the channel. Okay, thank you so much. So I'm just going to mess with the order slightly and bring in Lord Ricketts because I know he has to leave in two minutes. So um, Lord Ricketts, did you want to respond to that question quickly? Thank you very much indeed. And, and yes, I'm sorry I have to leave, but I will leave um, Baroness Hamwee to speak for me in, in wrapping up on all the other points. Um, just in two seconds, um, I totally agree with Helena um, and she said more forcefully what I was trying to say, that the habits of cooperation and the, the personal links that have been built up by UK policing over many years um, in Europe and elsewhere will over time erode inevitably. What can we do to compensate that? I think make the very most use of our continued access to places like Europol and Eurojust um, to ensure that the operational staffs are working very well together in the border controls and, and everywhere possible to continue being useful allies, bringing useful information, being major providers of intelligence and alerts and information um, to our European counterparts, and also continuing the parliamentary links, which are still just about possible, although more difficult now, um, to make sure that members of parliament, MEPs, 
um, continue to meet and we continue to be part at least of the wider family. Um, and just on migrants, uh, Christian, I just remind you that um, there have been UK uh, French migrant pressures for 20 years at least. This is nothing new at all. And it is a rather different situation to Belarus where migrants seem to be being instrumentalized by the Belarus government. I don't think anyone um, believes that France is doing that. It's a long, long run uh, problem across the channel. It can only be solved by good cooperation. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Lord Ricketts, and thanks for joining us. And uh, over to you, Baroness Hamway. For, sorry for keeping you for so long. <laughs> that, that's fine. I can't possibly speak for, for, for Peter. Um, I often find that he puts my thoughts much better than I could. Um, I've absolutely no um, knowledge about Poland, but my um, instinctive reaction to the question was very much as as Christians. It's quite convenient to be able to show that there can be really tough resistance at a border in to the um, government's um, current um, presentation. Uh, as Peter said, it is not the same situation. Um, I don't suggest that France is weaponizing uh, asylum seekers, but frankly, I, I think that our government is weaponizing asylum seekers in its approach to asylum and immigration policy. Um, the um, I come to the specific question last, if I might, but on terms in terms of connectivity, socialization, and so on. Um, I think personal relationships are so important. I mean, they can't replace um, everything. They can't um, um, go contrary to formal relationships, but they give a flavor, a texture to what's going on, which I don't think you can get without some of that. And I'm going to link this with the point about oversight. Um, the um, One of the committees I was on visited, it was the Human Rights Committee actually, visited Strasbourg. Um, and we went to the, um, the council. Um, and what came out of that from me, because I think site visits, if I can call them broadly that, um, allow for the personal relationships. But that site visit told me how difficult it is for some of the many members whom I think um, Elaine mentioned, how difficult it is for them to be heard at all. Someone from Georgia kept telling us that it was so important that the UK complied with a judgment. It was the prisoner's voting rights judgment because every refusal to comply was another thing that Russia could use in its argument about the weakness of all the rest of us and, and, and so on and was using it against Georgia as they, they saw it. Um, proactivity um, on ETIAS. I may be oversimplistic, but I think that, that the UK needs to be making contact with everyone who's going to be involved, not just saying the Commission is going to tell us what's happening and then we'll think about it. No plan is likely to flourish in any walk of life if one side says, here's the plan, you do it, without there being a discussion as to how doing it is going to happen. Um, the we wrote 53 questions to the Home Secretary about these border arrangements, had very short replies, and she said that where 
um, ETIAS and the EES may eventually be carried out within the juxtapo juxtaposed control areas. Existing international treaties between the UK and our international partners set out that we should collectively agree and determine the requirements. Well, collectively, to me, means getting stuck in as early as you can. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Baroness Hamwi. OK, so we have only a few minutes left and I don't see any questions in the chat. And knowing that um, I, I'm the only thing that keeps everyone from their lunch, I'm going to suggest that we finish the proceedings here. Uh, we, we have an hour for lunch and then we're due back at one o'clock for the second uh, panel um, with or without UK. Um, and let me just take the opportunity now to uh, say thank you to our four wonderful speakers for joining us today and for sharing their, their thoughts on this uh, really important area uh, of Brexit. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, let me thank the audience as well uh, for giving us their time uh, asking uh, penetrating questions and lending their ears to the talks. Um, and also to thank uh, Lena uh, Agat and uh, Sarah Wolf, who wasn't able to be here today for uh, having done everything to bring together uh, this wonderful event. So. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day and your weekends and um, do enjoy your lunch. Thank you. <laughs>